Well, welcome everyone to the 2017 Covey Lecture Series. Uh, we're excited to be sharing research on topics spanning the grape and wine value chain with you over the next uh, few months. Uh, today we're proud to present Dr. Tony Shaw, a professor in Department of Geography and Tourism Studies and a fellow here at, uh, at Covey. Dr. Shaw will be discussing the potential impacts of climate change on Ontario's main wine appellations and new emerging regions. Here at Brock University, Dr. Shaw teaches courses principally in the areas related to meteorology, applied climatology, viticulture, and environmental sustainability. His research areas include wine terroirs, site selection methods for new vineyards and freeze protection methods. He also studies renewable energy, building climatology, and climate change and impacts. His current research projects include the demarcation of subappellations in Ontario's main wine regions, assessment of new areas for wine production, and the potential impacts of climate change on Ontario's main wine appellations in emerging regions. So with that, please join me in welcoming Tony today for the Covey Lecture Series. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to welcome the audience here. Uh, very nice of you to turn up on a day like this. And also, I'd like to welcome those people who are on the webcast, uh, sitting in the comforts of their room, uh, enjoying uh, warm temperatures and looking out at the uh, the landscape, uh, snow and ice landscape. First of all, what I'd like to do is to give you sort of a quick rundown of what I will be doing in the next uh, approximately 50 minutes. Um, I have a number of slides here. More than likely, I may not be able to cover all of these uh, in the presentation, but since these would be on webcast, uh, anyone can look at them at their own, uh, at their own leisure. So, what I'd like to do, first of all, then, is to uh, give you a quick rundown of what's happening outside of Ontario. Uh, so I'll be looking at uh, the wine regions of Nova Scotia, uh, Quebec, and Okanagan. And then I'll focus on the wine regions of Ontario, and also on some of the emerging areas within Ontario in terms of uh, climate change. So, what I'd like to do then, first of all, is to look at the talk in terms of uh, breakdown by season. So I'll start off uh, with the spring uh, to see what kinds of temperature trends uh, we are seeing uh, in the spring, principally here for Ontario. Um, now, perhaps this year you probably uh, are of the impression that, uh, that the spring uh, is probably getting warmer until, of course, uh, yesterday. Uh, February has been the warmest month in the last 50 years, uh, certainly within the, uh, in Canada, uh, as evidenced by the data collected by Environment Canada. Now, this trend, of course, is not a persistent trend, uh, but in fact, uh, what we we'll see with the data is that uh, the trend is a weak increasing trend, but it's actually subjected to a high degree of variability. And one of the things about climate change is that uh, the climate is changing gradually, it's evolving gradually, it's not only in Ontario, but in fact throughout the world. In some areas of the world, the change is much more dramatic as you can appreciate in the Canadian Arctic region. Uh, in the rest of Canada, the changes are there, they're not as dramatic, but what we're seeing uh, associated with climate change are extreme events extreme events associated with precipitation, extreme events associated with very high temperatures, maximum temperature, and also we might add uh, extreme events associated with very cold temperatures. Uh, so these events, of course, are the ones that we tend to pay attention to. Uh, it is the extreme events that are catastrophic, and those are the events, of course, where we talk about risk. Uh, they're associated with high degree of risk, and this, those are the sort of things that uh, grape growers and winemakers try to address, and of course, uh, people in the insurance business are really about ensuring risk. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. So, uh, so looking at the spring then, uh, is our spring getting warmer? I looked at the data for the three, for Niagara, just to give you an indication, because I, there's so much to cover uh, in, the, uh, in this talk, I can give you too much detail in each one region. But the first one shows you the temperature trend for the month of uh, 
and I don't know if you can see this, May, April, and March, or March, April, and May. And uh, what I've looked at is the minimum temperature to see whether minimum temperature is increasing. And there does appear to be a very strong trend for the month of March, a slight increasing trend uh, for April, a little bit stronger for April, but not so much for May. So one of the things about uh, the growing season is that throughout the world, we're seeing earlier bud break uh, in many parts of Europe, uh, and of course, earlier bud break in even the warm areas of California. This, of course, bodes well for, uh, for, uh, for viticulture if you, are, if you have a climate that is characterized by a short growing season. Uh, certainly in Western Europe, in the principal wine growing regions of, uh, of France and Eastern Europe, as well as in Mediterranean, we're seeing a warmer spring, which means that we're seeing earlier bud burst, uh, uh, which is uh, good in a way. But in our climate, that could be problematic because early in bud burst means that you could have late spring frost. So while on one hand, the, the growing season may commence at an earlier date, it is not without some uh, degree of risk. Okay. So that's the situation for much of Ontario. Um, the trends in any one wine region is comparable to the trend in just about all three other wine regions uh, in Ontario. Uh, and also in the emerging area, mainly because the weather systems that affect us here in Ontario are major weather systems that tend to affect the entire area. The magnitude of the temperature precipitation change or snowfall obviously varies, uh, but the same systems uh, tend to affect the weather in Ontario. So the trend in one area uh, certainly uh, uh, can mirror the trend in other areas of, of Ontario. So is our spring getting warmer? Certainly. Uh, we're seeing some increasing signs that the spring is getting warmer. Is that a good or bad thing? Well, as I said, it could mean an earlier start of the growing season, but one of the things that we tend to dread, especially in a very, very warm spring, is the possibility of a late spring frost, uh, certainly mid to uh, late April, and often as uh, late as uh, early uh, May. So the other thing that I wanted to look at then is the growing season. And the growing season, of course, we describe the growing season as a period beginning from April to the end of October. That's the official growing season. Those are the calendar dates. Uh, in, technically, the growing season is when you begin to have temperatures climbing above uh, 10 degrees uh, centigrade, the uh, temperature which photosynthesis takes place, and when it falls up below 10 degrees uh, when photosynthesis is terminated. Uh, so that's, that's the growing season in the biological sense. Uh, from a calendar standpoint, of course, the growing season, uh, we, for a comparison of data across the globe and from, uh, between different regions, uh, the date, of course, is beginning of April to the end of October. So what I want to look at then are the, are the trends in the principal wine regions in Canada. Look at the Winkler Index, the growing degree days, because uh, when we assess the potential of an area uh, for wine production, quite apart from looking at the extreme minimum temperatures, we tend to look at the availability of energy uh, in that area and uh, how does that then uh, translate to the potential for varieties to reach their full ripening potential. So beginning with, uh, in this case here, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, of course, in Atlas Valley is emerging as a very, very important wine region. And this area has garnered some excellent awards, especially for their sparkling wine. And Northumberland, uh, the Northumberland Shore area of Nova Scotia, but the principal area is in Annapolis Valley. Um, and as you can see, um, Nova Scotia, the heat units, of course, are below 1200 for the most part. So it's a cool climate region and therefore ideally suited uh, for white varieties and a limited number of hybrid red varieties. Uh, so as you can see then, the trend is an increasing trend, but one thing you need to note, and this is characteristic of just about all the graphs I'll show you, as you can see, a tremendous degree of fluctuation from one year to the next. Uh, so that uh, the vintage, vintages vary from one year to the next. That might be a good, it could be a, a bad thing. I know that uh, each vintage is considered to be unique, and so uh, wineries can then uh, talk about the uniqueness of that particular uh, summer and how that translates to sensory qualities of the wine. 
But at the same time, you're after consistency and quality. So if you have a significant variation uh, from one year to the next in terms of uh, temperature, you're likely to have significant vintage variation. So this is one of the things that is very, very characteristic uh, of the data when we look at uh, the trends in, in growing degree days. Quebec. This is uh, from uh, uh, the area in the Eastern Township area. Uh, the Eastern Township area of Quebec is a very, very picturesque landscape and of course a number of small wineries uh, with, on, with uh, relatively small acreage on the cultivation. The climate there, of course, uh, is very, very continental. There's no maritime influence there, so it has very, very cold temperatures. Uh, in fact, it's the coldest wine region in Canada, the, the, uh, the Eastern Township area. But trend, of course, is an increasing trend. In other words, we're seeing, the, uh, based on the Winkler uh, uh, index, uh, the trend is an increase in trend. But notice the type of varieties that are, are grown in that area. They all tend to be a very, very, um, they're hybrid varieties, and of course some of them are Minnesota varieties that are being introduced. But that area is moderating. The, the climate, the, the, the winter climates are moderating, and the summer climates are getting warmer. But nonetheless, the temperatures are still very, very low. In other words, you have uh, temperatures dropping to minus 30 on a regular basis, which means that you have significant vine damage if these vines are not covered. So they cover their vines uh, uh, to uh, protect it uh, from extreme winter temperatures. And then we move into the Niagara region. The Niagara region, of course, is the principal wine growing region in Canada. Uh, it's the largest area and probably the most established area at this point in time. The second area, of course, of importance is the Okanagan area. So I have here the kinds of varieties that can be grown okay, uh, in this type of climate. We tend to consider ourselves a cool climate region. Um, a cool climate region is a region uh, with growing degrees uh, for the most part, less than 1,400 growing degree days according to the Winkle Index. Okay, so what we're seeing then is that we are actually moving uh, from a cool climate region to some extent, and as we'll see in the other one, uh, the other area, the Lake Erie North Shore. We, in some years, we tend to get very, very warm temperatures. Okay, and so we're evolving, uh, in fact, from a, a a region one into a region two, and in some years, in some exceptional years, we can, we'll have temperatures and heat units that is equivalent to a region three. And a region three, of course, is a warm uh, climate. So is that good or bad? Well, it's good in a way because uh, one of the problems that we have in cool climate regions, uh, of course, a problem of maturing red varieties, especially varieties such as Cabernet Sauvignon, Cap Franc, and so on and so forth. Uh, and some, some years ago, some growers have experimented with introduction of Syrah. And of course, Syrah does well in the growing season, uh, but it doesn't have the, the adequate number of heat units for it to reach its full potential. But more importantly, Syrah is a warm climate variety and it cannot survive the winters here. And so it's not, uh, I think many of some growers were lull into, uh, into thinking because the climate is getting uh, warmer or winters are getting uh, more moderate that these varieties can actually uh, succeed. Unfortunately, um, I think most of those varieties have been pulled out because uh, of winter damage. Nonetheless, I think what's happening now with, uh, with our climate is that we're seeing an, an evolution from a cooler area into a warmer area. And that, as I said, does have some implication for the type of varieties that we can grow. <coughs> and also it has some implication for wine quality in terms of especially reds, but also it can be problematic for some white varieties because especially early season variety and to a limited extent, uh, red varieties such as Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir, as you know, is a cool climate variety. It does really well with heat units under roughly 11, uh, 1,000 to 11 heat units. Uh, it doesn't do very well in a very warm climate. And of course, if you have very uh, warm temperatures, especially during a ripening period, the, the quality goes down. So that's the, that's the Niagara region. And of course, the Lake Erie North Shore. This is the area with a significant degree of, uh, of uh, probably the highest number of heat units in Ontario. 
And this area here, as you can see, is moving from the region two to region three, which is a warm climate. This area, of course, uh, red varieties do very well along Lake Erie North Shore because the season begins quite early. Uh, Lake Erie, of course, has a major uh, influence on this area here, uh, especially uh, in the fall, because in the fall, Lake Erie remains relatively open uh, and the warm uh, water surface temperature actually allows an extension of the growing season into the fall. Okay. The winter, of course, uh, is a little bit problematic because Lake Erie freezes over, and therefore uh, the chances are this area is quite uh, susceptible to winter injury, much more so than uh, Niagara region. But we're evolving then in this area from uh, a cool climate region into a warm climate area. Now, this, as I said, it, uh, it has mixed benefits because to some extent, uh, some varieties such as Pinot Noir may not do as well in this type of climate. Uh, but the reds will do very well, and late season varieties such as Riesling uh, probably will do much better uh, in this climate, especially if it's grown along the lakeshore area, because temperatures in the fall can be, uh, can be warm during the day, but can be cool at night, and that's ideal uh, for the buildup of sugar and retention of acid uh, at night. Some emerging areas, Prince Edward County, um, Sorry, the third one, uh, this is not in <coughs> Prince Edward County. Prince Edward County, of course, uh, again, you can see the fluctuation and the heat chinets, and this, uh, this area here is, to some extent, uh, still remains, if you will, uh, a cool climate area. Most of the heat chinets remain under 1400 degrees, degrees, so this is the ideal cool climate area for Ontario, the Prince Edward County. And the reason for that is, Prince Edward County gets the prevailing southwesterly winds blowing off Lake Ontario. So even in the summertime, the, the, the temperatures are kept moderately uh, cool. Uh, you don't have the kind of spikes in, uh, in temperatures you'll find in Lake Erie North Shore and in the Niagara region. So this area here, uh, I think will remain, if you will, uh, a bit more uh, on the cooler side uh, in spite of the dramatic change we're seeing, temperature mainly because of the beneficial moderating influence of uh, Lake Ontario. Of course, Lake Erie has, uh, uh, Prince Edward County has its problems, especially in the winter months, because uh, uh, vine damage, as we'll see in a moment, vine damage is quite uh, uh, high, the potential is quite high because uh, there's no moderation of the Arctic air mass uh, before uh, it gets to this area here. And then, very quickly, then, uh, we have some emerging areas, Gray County. Uh, Gray County is a, it's a beautiful, picturesque area, uh, very busy in the winter months for skiing and also very busy in the summer months. This area here is emerging as a cool climate area. Uh, the heat chillers here are under 1400 uh, growing degree days, uh, so uh, it is uh, ideal for, still for the cool climate uh, uh, varieties. Uh, Chasselas, which we don't grow, but I just have that as an indication. Chasselas, of course, is, is one of the number one white variety uh, in, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, makes some excellent wine. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Gamay, uh, Cab Franc, Riesling, Commercial It will not do well. Cabernet Sauvignon may not do very well here because the UTNs here are relatively low. Similarly, Cab Franc, even though it's listed, Cab Franc is a very much coldly hardier variety. Uh, and it could do well in some years, but for more, most years, uh, it may face a challenge because heat units are not high enough. And then we have Norfolk County. Norfolk County um, is, uh, I don't know whether I should say this, this is not official, but Norfolk County has applied for uh, Appalachian status. Uh, I think they're calling themselves South Coast, so that's this particular uh, area. Um, I've done some work in this area here, and so this might be the fourth wine region in Canada uh, if the application is successful, and I have no reason to think why it shouldn't be. Uh, it's a beautiful area. Uh, it used to be, uh, tobacco used to be king there, but of course the decline of the tobacco industry uh, meant that uh, farmers had to turn to alternative uh, agricultural activities. And of course, uh, wine production here is emerging as a very, very important uh, aspect of the economy of this area. So this area here 
uh, has the potential uh, to grow some excellent reds. The soils, of course, are principally sandy loam soils with some clay along the lakeshore area. But again, um, as you can see, the trend is an increasing trend, uh, but subjected to a high degree of variability. And it's, if you will, I usually always use the analogy of the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, over the long term, the, the TSX has been increasing. So if you buy an index fund, the chances are you can go to sleep and the chances are you're not going to make a lot of money when you wake up overnight, but certainly uh, you will make some money uh, because it's relatively safe. Uh, so it's an increasing trend, but as you know, the term often used is volatility. If you're in the stock market, uh, one of the things that you try to avoid is volatility. In other words, the up and down uh, uh, changes in, in the price of a stock, as we see here, again, the up and down change in the in heat units from one year to the next. And this is a challenging problem for grape growers, uh, is that, you, and that maybe it's good in a way, is that no two vintages are the same. No two vintages are the same. Uh, they, the climatic conditions uh, in the summer months can vary significantly from one year to the next. Uh, and while you can tell a good story about the vintage, let's say for last year, maybe this coming year you might find differences uh, based on uh, uh, precipitation and temperature changes. Uh, Huron County is also another emerging area. Uh, we already being to see some vineyards planted, and I think one or at least two wineries in this area here. Here in the county, uh, as you can see, is the ideal cool climate area, and the reason for that is it's it gets the uh, the influence of Lake Huron. Uh, strong prevailing winds coming off the lake, especially in northwesterly flow, keeps this area here uh, relatively cool. Uh, it's a beautiful area, uh, it's also a recreational area, so agritourism in these areas, Gray County and of course uh, Huron County, uh, agritourism has, has, been, uh, has been seen as a, a very, very important uh, uh, ac activity in this area, especially uh, with the decline of uh, certain crops, uh, field crops in this area. So Huron County, I think this would be also an excellent uh, cool climate region. Uh, it will have difficulty maturing some of the red varieties, but certainly uh, varieties that are a little bit cold hardy, uh, uh, such as Cap Franc might do well, and some white varieties. Chardonnay, of course, is sort of the, uh, the variety that does very well, even in warmer climate. Uh, it, does in, it does perform well in a wider range of climates, with the exception, of course, um, of some other varieties, such as Merlot and Pinot Noir, which are a bit more climate specific. So, here in County, uh, these are new areas that are emerging with tremendous potential. And I suspect then uh, with uh, a warming trend, uh, these areas then uh, would, uh, would fare well uh, in, in terms of uh, potential wine production. And finally, uh, heading, skipping across the prairie regions uh, right into the Okanagan. Uh, the Okanagan, of course, is a big area. It's about 150 miles long from north to south, so <clears throat> I can't cover all the area. But I chose the southern part of the Okanagan region because that is the one area that is seeing a dramatic change in temperature. South Okanagan is very warm. It's almost desert-like in condition, very, very low precipitation, so everything is irrigated. And, but as you can see, this area here has a climate <coughs> almost comparable to that of California, especially Napa Valley in a way. Uh, it's moving into a region three climate. In other words, uh, reds do very well in South Okanagan. Um, one of the problems, however, uh, with South Okanagan uh, summer climate is that you tend to have very uh, high temperatures during the day uh, and to some extent low temperatures at night, which is good in a way because uh, it means that you have a good buildup of, of uh, sugar during the day and uh, cooler temperatures and tend to preserve the acidity. So the diurnal temperature range for this area here is quite high. And one of the parameters that we use in looking at the potential wine style in an area is the temperature during the ripening period. Uh, typically, of course, uh, from the month of September uh, to October. The diurnal temperature range is quite high here. Uh, and of course, that means that even though temperatures during the day are quite warm, uh, nighttime temperatures tend to, if you will, offset some of the problems associated with elevated temperatures uh, during the day. 
So is Niagara, is this area changing? Yes, and it's changing quite dramatically. Uh, much more so than, uh, than other areas of Canada, primarily because of the fact that this area here is experiencing extremely warm temperatures. So this is just an indication, looking at the, the evolution of these areas across Canada in terms of the growing season. Now, you know, the growing season, when we, when we assess the, uh, the potential of growing varieties, grapes in an area, uh, we look, first of all, at the winter temperatures, because the winter temperatures still consider to be the number one limitation for viticulture, and for that matter, for perennial crops, whether it be peach, cherry, apple, so on and so forth. Wherever you have these crops grown, uh, you tend to have relatively mild winter temperatures. Um, so that's the number one limitation. But at the same time, we want to see what can be grown successfully in these areas during the growing season, because then the growing season then dictates to us what varieties have a chance of growing. And if they survive the winter, then those varieties and with suitable growing conditions, then we can have some idea of the potential for some varieties to survive. I might add uh, the risk, of course, uh, with viticulture uh, is not just confined to winter. Uh, we have the risk uh, in the uh, summer months. We can have very, very uh, high temperatures. We can have fungal diseases, especially in the Great Lakes area. We tend to have high incidence of fungal diseases. It's not just uh, the temperature we're paying attention to whether varieties can survive, but also we have problems in the, as we'll see in the, in the fall, uh, when you tend to prefer relatively dry and warm conditions, we tend to have a lot of precipitation. So what can be a vintage year, all up until the end of August, can turn out to be, to some extent, rather catastrophic if you have very high precipitation in the month of September and October. The Winkler Index, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, the Winkler Index is probably the international index used uh, for a comparison of the potential of an area. And the Europeans prefer the Winkler, uh, sorry, the, the, not the Winklers, uh, pass that one there. Uh, I had the, it was the Hugel index I wanted to show, but uh, um, what happened to that, I don't know. Anyway, this is just a summary of the three wine regions here uh, for Ontario. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're moving from a cool into a warm climate for the Niagara region. Uh, Lake Erie moving from an intermediate to warm, and certainly Prince Edward County, for the most part, stays for the most part within a cool climate area. Okay. So the climate is changing, and I want you to note also from the 1980s onwards, from the 1980s onwards, that's when we begin to see a dramatic increase in temperature. Okay. Uh, prior to that, of course, temperature fluctuations are relatively small. So from the 1980 onwards, those are, uh, those are, that's a period in, that we tend to have a fairly dramatic change in temperature. We also try to do some projection of how the climate is likely to change during the growing season uh, in using global uh, circulation models. Now, this work here uh, was done by Dr. Adam Fennick. Uh, he is, at one time was with Environment Canada uh, when they had the uh, climate change uh, uh, program. Uh, that program has been reinstated by the Liberal government, but uh, Dr. Fennick now is in um, uh, University of Prince Edward Island, and uh, he continues to do uh, research uh, uh, in viticulture, of course, and climate change. Um, so some of the work he was, was done through him here in terms of uh, modeling uh, three different scenarios. Uh, in other words, uh, the data I showed you is what we call the empirical data based on what's happening past events. And to some extent, we can forecast uh, what's likely to happen based on what we call a persistent trend. Uh, in other words, if conditions were to persist uh, into the future, uh, then we're likely to see, uh, if you will, the same 
uh, conditions increasing or getting uh, uh, or, or decreasing. Uh, the climate models also give us some idea of what is likely to happen. Uh, but as you know, uh, we do have problems with uh, short-term weather forecasting, let alone projecting what is likely to happen 50, 60 years from now. Because the climate system is not a, it doesn't behave in a linear fashion. Uh, things, we have what we call feedback effects within the climate system. So as temperatures warm up, uh, we tend to have more cloud cover, we tend to have more uh, uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, and that then could actually have either a positive or a negative feedback effect. So uh, it's not that simple, uh, but we try to, if you will, have some idea of, uh, of based on the different uh, climate scenarios, what's likely to happen 15, 20, 30, 50 years from now uh, uh, down the road. So we look at simply the projection of what is likely to happen in the Niagara region in terms of growing season temperature. So this is the empirical data, okay, uh, for the last 30 years. And then we have uh, under different climate scenarios, what's likely to happen to the total number of heat units. Uh, as you can see, based on the empirical data, we are seeing an increase in trend. So if we can project that uh, using different scenarios, this is what is likely to happen. In other words, then we can, we're moving into, by 2060, we are seeing heat units as much as, uh, actually there should be 2,000, 2,000 growing degree days. In other words, if conditions were to persist. In other words, uh, we know that we are embarking on uh, mitigation strategies to reduce greenhouse gases, whether it be the carbon tax or the uh, developing alternative renewable energy. Uh, the, the best case scenario, of course, is that we move very quickly towards a reduction in population Okay. Uh, also, a reduction in greenhouse gases, uh, changes in, ter in technology that are not uh, energy intensive, and so on and so forth. And so, we are likely to see then uh, some reduction in CO2. Uh, but how realistic that is going to be in the next 20 to 30 years, probably not so, because as you know, it's difficult to get international agreement in some of these things. Uh, Canada is moving ahead very quickly, even though. Uh, it's very difficult to balance on one hand environment and the other hand the economy uh, because you know people have to have jobs and at the same time we need to preserve the economy. Uh, so these, these types of debates uh, in the national and international arena can uh, actually significantly reduce the time necessary to take uh, immediate action to reduce the greenhouse gases. Nonetheless, uh, whether it be a worst case scenario or best case scenario, we will see an increase uh, in more uh, greenhouse gases uh, in the, certainly in the short term, I mean in the short term, I mean in the next 20 to 30 years. And that then would mean certainly an increase in temperature, which then would mean uh, an evolution to a much higher, uh, warmer climate uh, in the next uh, 25, 30 years. Okay. The other thing I want to focus on, so that's the growing season condition. So we have some idea of what's happening during the growing season. As I said, overall across Canada, uh, the growing season is warming and we're seeing then uh, more heat units, which means that some varieties uh, are able to perform much better uh, than they have done in the past. I also look at the number one limitation for viticulture and that is the occurrence of extreme damage in temperatures. Now, as I said, when we implement, um, for the most part, uh, when, we, when we're talking about risk, uh, climatic risk in this particular case, uh, climatic risk tend to be the number one limitation. If we have frequent uh, events with damage in temperature, or frequent events with very high precipitation, obviously you have a very, very high risk, which means that the success of that particular economic activity is uh, questionable. And so, when we look at the areas for viticulture, uh, the first thing that we tend to note is what kind of winter temperatures uh, uh, these areas are experiencing. And so we look at the extreme events because the extreme events are the ones that are very destructive. And you know, if you are in the business of uh, uh, whether it be a ski operator, uh, and you know that uh, every five, six years, you can have no snow drain the, uh, the 
the winter months, that could affect your business. And if that happens more frequently, eventually, of course, uh, you have to close down the operation because you have ongoing costs and you're not having any income. So the frequency of damaging temperatures, frequency of damaging precipitation, these tend to will, if you will, uh, determine the success of these agricultural activities. And so with climate change, we are seeing an evolution in the climate. And I want you to note also that evolution, the changes that we're seeing, especially in temperature, is very, very dramatic. It is very dramatic. In other words, we're seeing significant changes over a relatively short period of time. And embedded within that change are these extreme events. So the risks are quite high. The risk for viticulture, quite high uh, in terms of climate change. And uh, later on, I'll talk about adaptation if we have the time. Uh, if we don't, the slides will be there. Uh, but when we try to adapt to climate change, we're actually trying to adapt to the risky uh, events uh, to minimize our risk of respect to, to those particular events. So I'm looking at the potentially damaging temperature. Now, this is a threshold temperature that we have used for some time. And in other words, when the temperature falls below minus 20, the chances are you could see some damage to the primary bud. OK? The primary bud. Not the secondary bud, but the primary bud. Now, so one measure uh, of the success of viticulture in an area is to note the number of times that we have damaging temperatures during the winter months. Now, if you have minus 20 in the month of January uh, and February, the chances are you may not have major damage. Okay? Uh, but we'll see with climate change, something else is happening. Uh, okay? uh, so 20 degrees is a threshold often used. Well, we know that uh, uh, temperatures lower than minus 20, minus 23, you inevitably would have damage even in the middle of January. Uh, and of course, anything lower than that becomes problematic. So what we're seeing for the Niagara region is that you're seeing fewer events with extreme damage in temperature. And that's good. So in other words, our, our winters are moderating. Okay, winters are getting warmer. Uh, and certainly, the occurrence of extreme, uh, potentially extreme damage in temperatures going down. And that is the same for uh, both uh, for Lake Erie as well, Lake Erie North Shore. Uh, Prince Edward County uh, still remains high, the risk remains high. And if you understand the geography of your area, uh, you can appreciate that, okay? Uh, we are protected by Lake Ontario, and one of the reasons we had so much lake effect snow the last, uh, last 24 hours has to do uh, with a very, very long fetch across along Lake Ontario which is a northeast flow. In other words, you almost had the full length of the lake, which enabled the uh, winds to pick up a significant amount of moisture and dump it uh, along the area between Hamilton and the Niagara region. Uh, that is, and of course, the temperatures were not very high. Uh, we did not have very low temperatures because the lake surface temperature was relatively warm and it was able to pick up a lot of moisture, and at the same time, it moderated the temperature before it hits the southern shore of Lake Erie. Unfortunately, as you could appreciate, um, uh, Lake, uh, Lake, Lake Erie is a little bit more removed from Lake Ontario, uh, and Lake Erie, of course, is, uh, is frozen over for the most part, but we're seeing some changes in Lake Erie temperature in terms of open water, and that's another uh, story altogether in terms of climate change. So the occurrence of frequent damage in temperatures for these two principal wine regions is declining, uh, but certainly uh, is showing some slight decrease for uh, Prince Edward County. But for the most part, this area here remains uh, still a uh, uh, high risk area in terms of viticulture, uh, in terms of reduction of freeze injury. And I did very quickly, I don't want to go through all of Norfolk County since this could be the other uh, wine region uh, in Ontario. Um, uh, this area here, of course, has pretty high incidence of uh, damage in temperatures in the winter months because there's no moderation similar to, uh, to Lake Erie. Now, Lake Erie, uh, Lake Erie North Shore uh, gets a little bit of, of influence from Lake Huron. Okay, even though it's removed from Lake Huron, it gets uh, some moderating influence from Lake Huron. 
whereas uh, Norfolk County does not get that, in, that moderation. And as you can see very quickly, uh, this is what happened in February of 19, uh, between February 15, 16, uh, in the 2015. Just to show you that when we assess risk, it, often, it means often you get damage in temperatures. If you get damage in temperatures once in every five years and you have uh, blood damage down to 6 to 70 percent, that could be very problematic. And the Niagara region, even though the Niagara region uh, has the moderation uh, of uh, Lake Ontario, uh, you can see we have some very, very low temperatures, minus 30. This is away from uh, right up above the escarpment. Uh, and these, of course, is, those of you who are in viticulture, uh, in the basis of growing grapes, uh, can appreciate that particular year with lots of uh, damage to uh, the primary buds. So it's not often that we get this, but when it does, it can be problematic, okay? Now, I looked also at the, just for the Vineland, uh, the occurrence of, of extreme minimum temperatures in January, because we tend to get our coldest temperature in January, uh, and very often early February. As you can see, uh, a great deal of fluctuation, but appears to be an increasing trend. In other words, the January uh, extreme minimum temperatures, in other words, I took the coldest temperature for, uh, for January for each year and do a plot to see what's happening to that. Uh, the temperatures are getting warmer, okay? So in other words, we're seeing higher minimum temperatures for January, which suggests that uh, there is some moderation in winter temperatures, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, you still have occurrence of very, very low temperatures, okay? Uh, the, they're a little bit far in uh, between, which is okay. Uh, but nonetheless, you do have uh, the occasional event uh, when the temperature drops uh, to below minus 20. I also look at extreme events in the context of what's happening in the summer months. Our summers are getting warmer, as you can see from the heat units. And I looked at uh, temperatures greater than 30 degrees. Now, uh, for the most part, most vines do well. Uh, very, very uh, high levels of photosynthesis tend to occur with temperatures roughly between 18 and 24 degrees. Okay, when the temperature increase uh, above 24, you begin to see a slight decline in photosynthesis uh, because you tend to have higher leaf temperature. And then if you have warm, a very dry uh, soil moisture, then you tend to have some problems. But certainly when you get above 30 degrees, the uh, photosynthesis decline, you tend to have more stress to the vine, and that could be problematic. We are seeing from the 1980s onwards again, from the 1990s onward, uh, we're seeing an increase in the number of potentially uh, extreme maximum temperatures, okay? um, which is a concern uh, to some extent. Now, you have to ask yourself this question, however, not because you have extreme uh, maximum temperature in the summer months, uh, that necessarily means that uh, it's very, very uh, bad for viticulture. If it occurs in the month of uh, June and July, and possibly early August, it may not be problematic, okay? Because if you have enough soil moisture, then you, you can get through. But if you have a very, very high temperatures, we do sometimes in a latter part of uh, August, uh, when soil moisture is beginning to lower, and if you don't have uh, uh, artificial irrigation, then it could be problematic, okay? Uh, but there is some concern uh, that uh, that the maximum temperatures are increasing. Uh, the problem is, when we look at the data, uh, the total number, we're here we're plotting the total number of uh, maximum temperature increase. Occasionally, you may have uh, very, very high temperatures that may only last for a couple hours, and that is not problematic. If the temperatures remain very elevated for four, five, six, seven, eight hours, and it's also remain very elevated over several days, then that becomes very problematic. So one has to be very careful how you interpret the data. Saying that you have a total number of, uh, of days with temperatures above 30 that becomes problematic is quite misleading. Uh, it depends on the duration of the hot spell. 
Uh, if it lasts for five, six hours, that could be problematic. And if it happens over three, four, five days, that could be problematic. So we need to re-examine this data and look for consecutive days uh, where you have maximum temperatures exceeding 30 degrees. And that then gives you a better understanding of the risk that could be posed uh, by extreme maximum temperature. The other thing I want to look at then is the volatility. Um, one of the things that we're seeing with winters, uh, and the caveat here, that even though winter is getting milder or relatively, relatively milder, what's happening in the month, especially the month of January and uh, parts of February, uh, you, you know, in, in much of southern Ontario, you've heard of the term January thaw. In other words, there is a, a week or two of relatively mild temperatures. Okay, uh, and that may may not occur every year, but it has occurred this year. Okay, and the January thaw, uh, you might get some snowfall, but very light snowfall, but the temperatures can go up, climb up above uh, zero degree. One of the things about looking at extreme temperatures and using certain threshold is that that might be, to some extent, while it may be useful as a way of assessing the risk of an area, what we're finding is that because we're seeing milder winters, uh, the chances are the damage to primary buzz can occur at much higher minimum temperatures. In other words, the temperatures don't have to fall to minus 23 or minus 20 for damage to occur. Because the vines go through a dormancy period, they have what we call chilling requirements, and some varieties have very, very short chilling requirements, some have much longer chilling requirements. Once those chilling requirements are fulfilled, and you have temperatures moderating, in other words, temperatures climbing above zero, obviously we know that uh, uh, you tend to have uh, some problems because buds begin to swell, and then all you need are temperatures probably at minus 15 and even minus 10 degrees that can, be, that can cause damage. So this is the new risk for viticulture, uh, certainly in Ontario, is that while we're seeing a moderation in temperatures during the month of January and February, while well, that might say, well, that's all great, uh, but the problem is uh, we are seeing another type of danger associated with, uh, uh, with uh, freeze injury. And freeze injury then can occur at a much higher temperatures because the buds deharden uh, once the plants have reached your chilling requirements. And if ambient weather temperature conditions are milder, then you could have some significant uh, problem. Now, I I'm hoping that this particular winter, because uh, we've already into March, so plants are, are coming out of dormancy, and if we have milder temperatures that climb right into March, who knows, we could have a uh, bud burst uh, in late March or April, and as you know, typically we get a high pressure system, okay, a high pressure system uh, with clear calm conditions, and uh, you could have some killing frost. So they are, viticulture is fraught with all kinds of climatic challenges. Uh, so we cannot be, uh, if you will, uh, too complacent to think that, well, our winters are getting milder. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, a new type of dangers is emerging, and that danger is associated uh, with relatively mild winter temperatures, uh, which means that vines can come out of dormancy much earlier. And this is an example then of what happened this year. Okay, uh, as you can see, the temperatures remain above zero uh, for a number of days. Okay, this is the beginning of uh, December. Uh, I've been, I think I was up to March the, the 10th. Okay, uh, that's not good. Okay, that's not good at all. Okay, which means that uh, buds have already re met their chilling requirements and uh, we, we're seeing, we're seeing actually in, in Northern Europe. Uh, actually, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing also the same kind of problem. We're seeing earlier spring uh, warm up, and we're seeing early bud burst. Uh, but the new challenge you now is for uh, frost. Pro frost could be uh, killing frost could be a problem. So uh, the challenge for viticulture uh, in the context of climate change 
uh, I hate to be pessimistic, uh, but the challenges, a new set of challenges are emerging. It's not just the fact that you have very cold temperatures, uh, but a new set of challenges are emerging, uh, especially in view of a, a relatively mild winter. Now, if you have frost, wind machines will work. If you have a frost associated uh, uh, with high pressure system and the presence of an inversion, the wind machines tend to do well in those situations. But if you have an advective frost, in which uh, you have a cold uh, air moving into an area, uh, wind machines obviously uh, don't work. Uh, and people who bury their vines, as they do in Prince Edward County and Quebec, uh, they're probably much safer that st from that standpoint. So a new set of challenges likely to emerge uh, uh, in terms of volatility. We do have a lot of volatility also in our growing season. And what I've done here is simply to take the uh, 30 years of data, uh, yeah, the mean, find the mean uh, growing season for the Niagara region, and then look at the deviation from that mean. So the mean is 1,490 growing degrees, uh, using the data from 1971 to, uh, I think, 1971 to 2010, I think it was. Okay. Um, or 2000. Um, and look at the deviation. So when we talk about vintage variation, you saw it from the trend analysis, but as you can see, uh, you do have uh, below normal uh, below normal heat units uh, uh, in this period here, and then from here on, you tend to have a, a above, but with significant variability from one year to the next. And as I said, this is very, very typical of a mid-latitude climate. We are in the middle latitude, which means that we're subjected to uh, warm spells, cold spells. Uh, we get one day, very often no two weather systems are the same, no two days uh, have the same type of uh, weather. Uh, this is not the best climate in a way. In other words, it's not as consistent as a Mediterranean climate uh, or a trop subtropical climate. Uh, we are in the middle latitude and we are surrounded by warm air uh, to the south and cold air to the north. Okay, we have some days with heavy rainfall, some days uh, with light rainfall, some many days with no rainfall. So this is something uh, which the growers have to grapple with, uh, the volatility uh, in the growing season uh, from one year to the next. We looked at the precipitation data. Um, during the growing season. The precipitation actually tend to be a bit more consistent for the Niagara region and for that matter for much of southern Ontario. Uh, we, don't see the, we do see some variability, uh, but the variability is not as pronounced uh, when it comes to precipitation. In other words, and precipitation is much more reliable uh, in much of southern Ontario. Um, we do have some years with heavy rainfall and we do have some extreme events but for the most part, uh, the trend overall for precipitation is a very, very weak increasing trend, uh, but not subjected to the high degree of variability as we see in terms of the heat units. So that's some, uh, those are some of the conditions uh, uh, related to growing season condition. And one of the concerns, and I'm not gonna spend too much time, one of the concerns uh, with the climate change, certainly in Ontario, uh, is the ice wine industry. As you know, I think Ontario produces more than 70% of the ice wine in Canada. Um, and uh, the industry has garnered all kinds of international awards for ice wine, excellent ice wine. Um, but they, we're seeing some challenges for ice wine. Um, very quickly, um, I looked at the Ideally, the growers would like to uh, pick the ice vine around Christmas time, at least in, uh, sometime in December. Uh, I, I looked at the number of picking days, and picking days, of course, are days with temperature uh, below minus eight degrees. Um, the ideal temperature, I, I, I'm told, to, for picking ice vine is around 10 degrees. Um, uh, but we're seeing then some reduction in the number of picking days, okay? In other words, then the winter temperatures are getting uh, fewer and fewer days uh, available for uh, temperatures below a minus eight. Uh, January, uh, the number of picking days also uh, is uh, declining somewhat. Um, 
But by the end of January, uh, I didn't do March because by the end of March, once you get into March, uh, there's no point. Uh, I mean, if you have a very, very, yeah, relatively mild temperatures and you have uh, lots of rain, then you, you do have some problems uh, with the grapes. So I didn't look at uh, uh, March. But this is the overall trend for December and January uh, for ice wine. So the number of picking days are declining. Um, that is not to say that um, uh, you don't have days with, uh, uh, for available for picking, uh, uh, harvesting ice wine, but uh, be warned that they, those days are getting um, fewer and fewer uh, with climate change. Okay, and very quickly, I want to look at the influence of the Great Lakes uh, because viticulture is not possible in this area. Successful viticulture is not possible in this area if it weren't for the presence of uh, especially Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And now Lake Huron is becoming even more influential because the open waters of these uh, lakes during the winter months uh, is what providing the moderation uh, for the land climate and helps to, if you will, uh, to keep uh, extreme minimum temperatures at a higher level. What we're seeing for, this is uh, this year's lake cover. Um, as you can see, uh, the lake cover here, 2016 ice cover, uh, very small, relatively warm uh, winter. Uh, this was the El Nino year, as you recall, okay. Uh, very little ice cover, okay. Even Lake Ontario, uh, Lake Huron, a significant portion of Lake, on lake Huron is open. So if we were to see more of this occurring, because the lakes have a tremendous control, especially during the winter months. Lake effect snow, one of the things about uh, open waters is quite apart from the moderation of, the, of, of land temperature, is that um, lake effect snow. Uh, lake effect snow is, will increase uh, with climate change. There's no question about that. Mainly because you have more open water. And winds coming out of the northwest or northeast at temperatures below, well below minus uh, uh, zero degree will pick up a significant amount of moisture. So we will see an increase in lake effect snow uh, with climate change. We already seen that. You had a good glimpse of, uh, of this the last uh, day or so, the last 24 hours. Uh, what we had yesterday was a fetch winds coming out of the northeast. Uh, blowing along like this, a fitch, full fetch of Lake Ontario and dumping a significant amount of precipitation uh, in form of snow in this area here. We also had this, the system that moved ahead, picked up a lot of moisture off Lake Erie and quite a bit of Lake Erie is still open uh, and dumping it into this area here. So, and similarly, uh, when the winds move into a northwesterly direction, as you know, we get a lot of uh, uh, lake effect snow, so the Georgian Bay area, uh, right along Lake Huron, which is noted for good skiing conditions uh, because of a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of uh, snow coming off uh, uh, Lake Huron, those you'll see an increase in that. So I think for, for the lakes themselves, which play a very important role, the ice cover then is very crucial. And we're seeing an increase in ice cover uh, for the reduction, sorry, of ice cover for Lake Ontario. In some years, only about 10% of Lake Ontario is actually covered in ice. Much of it is open water. As I said, that's the saving grace uh, for the region. We also see, Same, I don't have it for, I thought I had it for um, Lake Erie. Uh, Lake Erie is also, Lake Erie for the most part, uh, tend to have a, a larger percentage of the surface covered by ice, but that also is declining, and similarly Lake Ontario. Those are the three lakes that have a very, very important influence, uh, both on our, our growing season conditions, in terms of cooling off things, but also a very significant uh, uh, influence in terms of moderating temperatures coming from uh, the north in terms of Arctic air masses. And I tried to do a little bit of a crude uh, an, an, an comparison here. Uh, the ice cover, uh, looking at Lake Ontario ice cover and growing degree days. 
Um, and we notice that as the ice cover goes down, in other words, more open water, uh, we tend to have, uh, of course, a higher number of heat units. And this, of course, corresponds to the same chain. In other words, the lakes themselves do not react in the same way as, uh, as land temperatures because, you know, uh, water bodies are less, uh, they're more conservative in terms of their thermal properties. They don't heat up very quickly, they don't cool down very quickly. But nonetheless, they do retain a lot of energy uh, uh, during the uh, warm summer months, and that energy then can be released uh, in the fall, and which then can prolong the growing season in the fall. Uh, this is what Lake Erie does uh, for uh, Lake Erie North Shore, and this is what, to some extent, uh, Lake Ontario does for the Niagara Peninsula. Lake Ontario's temperature, mind you, is not as warm as Lake Erie, because Lake Erie warms up very quickly and cools down very quickly, whereas uh, Lake Ontario is like some of you, right? Takes you a long time to warm up, and when you do get warm up, it takes you a long time to cool down. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> the precipitation, very quickly, as I said, uh, uh, we don't seem to talk a great deal about precipitation, only if it's extreme events. Uh, for much of southern Ontario, the the global circulation models done by, uh, and the forecast done by Environment Canada uh, shows a slight increase in precipitation uh, for much of southern Ontario. And in fact, that increase is found throughout much of Canada. The national trend for Canada is that there's an increase in precipitation, not a significant, but certainly a gradual increase. Uh, we're not seeing any major increase here for uh, uh, or ma any major change uh, in the total growing season precipitation, uh, but nonetheless, uh, as I said, the variability uh, seemed to be relatively small in comparison to the temperature. So that's a good thing. Right? The need for artificial irrigation may not be as pressing uh, at this point in time. Okay, the other thing I want to look at um, is the ripening period, and this will conclude what I have to say. Uh, because wine quality, to some extent, is determined uh, by what happens uh, during the latter part of the growing season, the period from berries on to harvest. Uh, typically, for most varieties, occur in the month of, uh, of September and October. Okay. Now, I'm looking here at the the temperature for the month of September. September temperature for the most part, uh, September minimum temperature, has a very important bearing on wine quality. And someone, uh, Greg Jones, has done a classification, uh, not, not Greg Jones, sorry, uh, a study that was done by two gentlemen, uh, one from France, uh, both of them from France, looking at the September temperature and what the implication is for wine quality. And so they looked at the minimum temperature and what we're seeing is that if you have minimum temperatures, uh, in this case here, less than 12 degrees, so average minimum temperature less than 12 degrees, the type of wine that you can expect uh, would be a wine that has fairly high degree of high level of acidity, okay? And one that moves into a cool climate area, the minimum temperature is a little bit higher, and of course, uh, uh, a little bit higher is in a temperate, uh, uh, sort of one comparable to a temperate climate. What we're seeing is that there's a slight evolution uh, in the wine climate, not very pronounced for the Niagara, uh, a bit more pronounced for uh, Lake Erie North Shore, and we tend to have a declining. In other words, September minimum temperature is showing a slight decline for, uh, for Prince Edward County. Now, as I said, the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature, uh, the diurnal temperature range, very, very important. And when we look at the diurnal temperature range, uh, which is the difference between the daytime maximum temperature and the nighttime minimum temperature, um, this is very, very important. Uh, in other words, if you have very high temperatures during the day and relatively cool temperatures at night, that is considered to be 
good for uh, the preservation of acidity, especially in a climate that is very warm, uh, in the case of South Okanagan. The, I was in, in South New Zealand, um, and the area in South New Zealand, um, the climate there is one that's characterized by very high temperatures during the day and very cool temperatures at night. And you have a large diurnal temperature fluctuation. So in spite of the fact that you had very warm temperatures, Pinot Noir actually was able to do very, very well. Okay, so it's a, one, of the, one of the parameters then that we look at that is of concern uh, to many growers, especially in a Mediterranean climate uh, that is characterized by warm temperatures, especially in Napa Valley. Napa Valley has very warm temperatures during the day and relatively cool temperatures at night. But along the uh, Pacific coast, uh, the temperatures, of course, the fluctuation in down range is very small because uh, daytime temperatures tend to be relatively cool and nighttime temperatures not much cooler. So the range is very, very small. Heat units along those areas are very low. In fact, uh, you'll be surprised to know that some of the coolest wine regions are found along the, uh, along the California coast, uh, where temperatures are quite moderate. As you move inland into the San Joaquin Valley, uh, you have very large diurnal fluctuations, very, very almost hot during the day, but temperatures at night can fall uh, quite low. And so you have uh, very high sugar levels, but to some extent, you tend to have some uh, some preservation of sugary uh, acid acidity, even though acidity can actually degrade uh, if, if minimum temperatures stay relatively high. For the Niagara regions, our diurnal range is relatively small. It's about 10 degrees. In other words, the maximum temperature is not very high and our minimum temperature is not very low. And the reason for that is Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario keeps the, the minimum temperatures quite high and the maximum temperature relatively low. It, in other words, Lake Ontario uh, provides, if you will, a semi-maritime a semi climate. Okay, we are not, if you will, not the, not the typical continental climate subjected to diurnal, large diurnal range. So I think that bodes well, uh, to some extent, uh, for the area, but also what it shows is that those range are increasing. Okay, they're increasing as you move into, uh, into especially uh, in the case of Lake Erie North Shore, it's increasing. Uh, sorry. It's increasing, uh, especially for uh, Lake Erie North Shore, not so much for Prince Edward County, and you can appreciate why Prince Edward County would not have a large diurnal range because of the overwhelming influence of Lake Ontario. Okay, uh, where you're a little bit removed from the, uh, from the lake that the range becomes higher. Now, I want to say this to you. Within the Niagara regions, we have 10 subappellations, and a very important project that I'd like to undertake at some point is to look at the diurnal range in each subappellation, because one of the distinguishing uh, characteristic of the subappellation is the diurnal temperature range. If you're along the lake shore, the range is very small. As you move inland, the, layer, the range becomes much higher. Now, large dial range is not necessarily good because large, large dial temperature range also can indicate potential for freeze injury. If you have very, very high temperatures during the day associated with a high pressure and the temperature falls dramatically at night uh, to below zero, that's, that's not good. And when we look at uh, the risk of frost in an area, we look at the diurnal temperature range because that is very, very crucial, okay? So one way in which we, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the subappellation is the diurnal temperature range. It does have implications for freeze injury, but also it does have implication for wine quality, as I said to you. And lastly, I looked at one of the things that is, um, somewhat problematic for us here in Ontario. And that is the precipitation during the ripening period. All the conditions, okay, nice sunny weather, adequate number of heat units, uh, great viticulture practices, uh, uh, maybe no, no disease pressure during the growing season. Then you come into the month of September. A real vintage year, 
is a year in which you have relatively high growing degree days and a relatively dry ripening period, warm and dry ripening period. So those are some of the session conditions for good vintage yields. Unfortunately, uh, this is characteristic of much of southern Ontario. You have high precipitation during the month of September and October. And so all the conditions then that are actually leading up to a vintage year can actually deteriorate quite quickly in the month of September and October. This is the October, uh, very quickly, I looked at the precipitation in August. Precipitation in August, quite high, okay, up to 100 milliliter, millimeters. Uh, and it's, but it shows a declining trend in September, a slight increase in trend. And then I combine the two months, uh, October, sorry, for October rainfall, let me see, sorry. September and then October, October shows an increase in trend in rainfall. And the reason for this is, what happens is, uh, the season begins to change. The summer months, of course, much of the precipitation is a result of convective activity. Scatter showers here and there. We have the occasional cold front that comes in, but uh, not too frequent. The much of southern Ontario is characterized by high pressure, okay, which then suppresses precipitation activity. But as you move into the month of September and October, the jet stream begins to dip south, okay, and so you begin you bring in more frontal systems. And with those frontal systems, you have also low pressure systems, which then brings in much precipitation. So this is one of the problems that we face uh, uh, in Ontario, and if I might say for much of Canada, uh, certainly uh, area east of the Prairie region, we tend to have very high precipitation during the ripening period. That is not about to change, even though September uh, is showing some signs of a reduction in precipitation. The month of October uh, is not showing any any real major signs in terms of precipitation reduction. So that's the one concern that still remains for viticulture in the context of climate change. Ideally, we would like to see a decline in precipitation during these two months, but it's not it's not it's not appear to be uh, showing any significant trend. Okay. So. What are some of the positive, how are we doing for time? I'm... Uh, okay. So just to uh, provide in some, uh, some indication of, of so-called benefits and, and risk. For winter, reduction in number of damaging winter extreme events, which is good. As I said, the, the data shows quite clearly. Um, but the negative aspect is that we see a prolonged temperature above zero, that can reduce uh, uh, cold hardiness. So this is one of the concerns that uh, we have, is that even though overall extreme damage in temperature declining, uh, the occurrence of warm spell followed by cold snap can, be, can pose a new challenge for viticulture. And that is, as you see, as I said, I, I hope that this particular uh, winter and spring, we don't have that problem occurring because the vines are already coming out of dormancy. You notice the trees are already budding, right? Uh, uh, the maple tree is already, uh, you probably see crocus in the ground already. Um, and the last thing we need uh, is, a, is a major spring frost. And I, so let's pray to, uh, to the higher power uh, to save us from that. So winter damage could actually increase due to the occurrence of freeze thaw and therefore damage could occur at much higher minimum temperature. So when we look at the analysis now, in terms of risk of freeze injury across Canada, we need not look at minus 20 anymore. We need to look at much higher minimum temperatures, 10, minus 10, minus 15 degrees, as a way of assessing the damage, a potential risk of damage. Uh, so minus 20 to me is, is not crucial, certainly not in Ontario. Uh, minus 15, uh, we need to look at the occurrence of damage in temperatures in month of December, January, February with a, uh, the much higher threshold because I believe uh, with climate change and a moderation of uh, winter temperatures in the month of uh, January, we could see the potential for freeze injury at much higher levels. 
Okay, warmer and longer growing season could enhance ripening potential for reds and late season varieties. Negative, we're seeing more volatility in the growing season. As you see, it's a fluctuation from one year to the next. Now, there are ways of dealing with the vintages, and I will, I'll talk about very quickly in terms of wine quality. The potential for full maturity uh, of some of the late season varieties, as you know, we always are uh, struggling to mature Cabernet Sauvignon, Cab Franc, the red varieties in particular. I think uh, in some years we do have there, uh, I have a, I did a study looking at vintage years in which the, the average growing season is above 1,600 growing DB days. And those are uh, years in which you had the reds did really well. The, the, uh, grape growers made ex and winemakers make excellent wines during those vintage years. There are about seven or eight of them uh, from the period 1971 to 2014. So we do have some, uh, we do have embedded within the uh, short growing season, cool growing season, some uh, period of relatively ideal conditions. Uh, but that's the nature of the, the wine business. Uh, it's very hard to get consistency. Uh, we could see then also expansion into new areas, and we're seeing that already. Uh, with climate change, the area that are one considered to be uh, climatically marginal, uh, those areas are emerging. We, uh, we look very briefly at Prince Edward County, um, uh, sorry, at uh, uh, Gray County, Lake Huron, uh, Norfolk County, Northumberland County, uh, also close to the other side just of, uh, uh, of Toronto. Uh, we are seeing some signs also in the Ottawa Valley. I mean, they're trying to grow some grapes in that area. Um, so these are areas that are emerging with climate change, not to, no, not to say that they don't have their risk, uh, but, but we're seeing then, uh, if you will, a uh, much, uh, much broader area that will come under grapevine production, but most of them would stay within the Great Lakes area. My, my belief is that the Great Lakes still continue to have a major positive impact on, on, on viticulture in the Niagara region or much of southern Ontario. One of the things about warmer summers, we could see an acceleration of uh, ripening potential. Some varieties uh, may have to be picked at an early date. This is one of the strategies that's already been adopted in France and some of the Mediterranean countries, is that uh, the growing season may start early, but the maturity date is much earlier, and so our growers might want to pick uh, at a much earlier date in order to at least preserve acidity. Enough sugar is present, but to preserve acidity. So that's one of the strategies used uh, by uh, growers, uh, certainly in Europe, given the uh, uh, increase in temperature. Now, what are the problems with climate change and the strategies that we, ad that we adopt or we adapt to the strategies? Uh, of adapt strategies uh, is that much of the, the viticulture practices we see, whether it be spraying, uh, setting up wind machines, uh, predicting uh, frost and, and looking at uh, uh, bud damage and so on and so forth, those are actually in response to what's happening. Those are the events that occur on a regular basis, the re recurrent events. And the growers know how to deal with it. And grape growers in Ontario and across Canada, I have to say they're very, very innovative, very receptive uh, to, to new ideas. And uh, they themselves seek out and develop new ideas. So the industry is fairly vibrant. Uh, the people who are in the wine industry are, I have to say, they are on the cutting edge of the, tech, new, uh, of the latest technology, both in terms of viticulture practices and winemaking. There's no question about that. The industry has uh, uh, new immigrants, it has uh, immigrants who came here many years ago, and you have also people who were born, I, some of our, our graduates from the Covey are, are young people who are citizens who were born here and who are familiar with the environment. So the industry actually has a, a fairly highly qualified and very diversified range of expertise. And so there's no question that they're doing well in terms of dealing with the recurrent problems of winter freeze uh, with uh, uh, fungal diseases and so on and so forth. The biggest challenge that the industry is facing, or will face, is what do we do? What do we do uh, in terms of uh, future climate change? How do we anticipate uh, the changes? And then what can we do to minimize the risk? This is just probably the one thing that uh, is fairly daunting. And the reason for that is, as you know, um, 
viticulture, like uh, horticulture crops, uh, once planted, uh, it's, very, it's not very easy to dig up things and say, okay, I'll switch to soybeans or corn, right? Um, so vineyards that are planted, new vineyards that are planted, now will be in production, commercial production for the next 25 years at least, right? And so how do you change from that uh, to if, you, if the climate is changing and you want to grow Syrah or you want to grow um, another variety which is not as cool hardy, uh, it's not that easy. So the biggest challenge then is to how do we anticipate the change in climate and then how do we prepare for uh, the risk. That of course will depend a great deal on the kinds of climate scenarios that are we able to present to the grape growers. Now climate, long-term climate change is fraught with problems in terms of prediction because the climate is changing. It's not, it's very dynamic. The climate is very dynamic. And uh, we, in a, as a global society, uh, we're not all moving in the same direction. Uh, we are not moving in the same direction in terms of combating the problem of climate change. Some countries are very progressive, uh, some are dragging their feet, some simply cannot do anything because uh, uh, they simply don't have the economic uh, and the political wherewithal to make those changes. So the, the entire system is not moving at the same rate. And that makes a, a, that presents a, a major challenge of what happens, uh, it's not what happens here in Canada only matters, what happens outside of Canada. So the, the entire climate system is highly interrelated. And unless uh, we act as a global society uh, to deal with the issue, we will see a, a lot of uncertainty in terms of what to expect in the next 34 to 50 years. So the, the participatory strategy uh, is uh, or the anticipation of what is likely to happen is more difficult and getting people to make changes now in anticipation even 20 years down the road is not very easy because consumers taste actually change. Remember grape growers are not just responding to climate or environmental changes, they're responding to government uh, initiatives, they're responding to economic marketing conditions. Uh, because it's not what grows, it's not what only what grows matters, it's whether you can sell it, okay? Uh, so the growers have to be very, very uh, thoughtful. They have to be able to look through so many different lenses because what can grow successfully here in Ontario or in Canada is not maybe what the consumers want. And consumers, of course, are very, very finicky uh, when it comes to uh, uh, taste. And remember, we're dealing in a market that is highly competitive, certainly here in Ontario. So it is a very, very complex uh, uh, set of challenges that grape growers and winemakers face. Climate change is only one of them. And I don't think they're sitting up late at night worrying about climate change. Uh, they're thinking uh, more so whether they have their grapes harvested and whether they can get a good price for it, and whether that can be made into quality wine and whether in the long run that then can compete with the uh, relatively inexpensive wine that's coming into the Canadian market. Some, some quick strategies then that they have. Uh, one of the things that um, some of the countries are doing is, is to expand the uh, areas on the production. So um, we've seen for countries such as uh, Chile and Argentina, they're also facing some serious issues in terms of climate change. And it's no small wonder uh, when you go to, uh, I was in Mendoza province, um, beautiful area, very warm climate. Uh, much of their water comes from irrigation filling off the, the Andes. Their only challenge is hail. They don't have a major problem uh, during the growing season. They have adequate amount of water, but they also face with drought. Uh, and so, but also the climate is getting warmer, and so they're trying to move up into higher elevation areas. Uh, so similarly with Chile, there, and I was in a conference in South Brazil in Rio Grande Sul. Uh, they have a very successful wine industry in that area, but again, temperatures are getting warmer, and so the one strategy that they have is they're trying to move their vineyards up to higher elevation areas. That doesn't happen overnight, it takes a long time to acquire the land. Uh, but nonetheless, these are some of the strategies uh, the growers are trying to do, is to diversify 
the areas under production. And then it means then you have some areas that are cool, some areas that are warm, and blending, blending uh, uh, wines from different areas is one way in which you then can uh, at least even out the variation in vintages and also provides some consistency in terms of style. But also, uh, there's, some, uh, there's a preference also to look at uh, uh, different grape varieties and blending the varieties. Uh, we know that many of the growers actually engage in this already. Uh, you, you'll see, in some cases, very few varietal blend. In other words, uh, or grapes with a single variety, uh, you tend to see uh, a blend uh, it's not only happening in the, in the red wines, but it's also occurring in white wines. So blending uh, wines from uh, maybe different vintages or different areas is one way in which uh, some of the uh, ways to deal with the variation in wine quality. And this is happening all the time. And we know that uh, wines with very, very high alcohol level, they have techniques for de-alcoholizing the wine. So, or if the wine has very low acidity, to add that. Uh, but of course, uh, you don't hear about that uh, because most uh, uh, winemakers prefer to uh, make wines the natural way. Okay? But those are some of the strategies. It's already occurring uh, in parts of Europe. Something that I am uh, very, very much in favor of, we still don't have an, uh, enough climate data uh, for these areas. Uh, we do have the monitoring done, Vine Alert, a good system that has worked very well, and the tree innovation monitoring system in the, uh, in the various uh, appellations. The data so far, we don't have long-term data. We need more long-term data so we can actually see how these different sub-appellations are emerging. The data that I use is from major uh, weather stations because the data has it's long-term data, so we can do trend analysis. Uh, the, the stations may not uh, give you very good spatial coverage, uh, so this is something that uh, certainly we need to spend more money and time developing is a uh, uh, more careful monitoring uh, in, in these different appellation and sub-appellations. Okay. I go through this very quickly because uh, it's easier to say that we should develop disease, resist disease resistant varieties. I'm losing my voice here. It's easier said than done. Develop disease resistant varieties, de develop uh, cold resistant varieties. These things take a long time. And one of the things that we need to do in adaptation is we need to have much stronger institutional support. This uh, the universities are doing research, but we need more governmental supports. The Grape Growers Association, the various associations are behind uh, all of this. But that type of institutional support is, is mandatory, is necessary, because we're looking at long-term research. Uh, the profits or the money is uncertain. And very often we may develop varieties that are not suitable in terms of the, the, the wine they produce. Because in the final analysis, developing something that's cold resistant or disease resistant doesn't necessarily mean, well, we've got it, uh, is whether the wine made from that is drinkable and whether it is, is, can be sold. So, but this, this kind of long-term support is crucial to the industry. And governments have always played a major role uh, in providing financial and institutional support to get industries going. And i like to see more support uh, for the wine industry since the wine industry is, has become a very, very major economic activity across, the, across Canada. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, in the kinds of uh, things I discuss in terms of the challenges faced by climate change, uh, the individual growers cannot do this kind of research. We need uh, strong institutional support. So this is something uh, I think when we talk about adaptation, long-term adaptation, this is what I'm talking about, not short-term. I'm not talking about uh, uh, putting up wind machines and to deal with frost and that sort of thing. We're talking about developing varieties, identifying areas, new areas, uh, which takes time, uh, so that as industry expands, we move to new areas uh, to reduce our risk. Uh, these things take time, but they need a lot of institutional support.
Oh, in conclusion, then. It potentially impacts your mix containing challenges and opportunities. Okay, so we do have, um, it's not all doom and gloom. Certainly the industry uh, can benefit, but as I said, uh, we still have some challenges to face, especially uh, in the uh, winter months. The winter still continue to be problematic, even though the temperatures are moderating. The adaptive strategies in response to recurrent climate events and economic factors are widely practiced. And this is why I say to you, uh, all the problems all that the growers can identify, they know what varieties to choose, they know the location uh, that cho uh, to choose. They, they are very good at, uh, at uh, managing disease pressure and so on and so forth. And in the wineries, the, uh, the winemakers are very good at dealing with, uh, uh, with the uh, the grapes that come into them to make wines of consistent and very good quality. There's no question there. So those, but those are the the day-to-day -day challenges. Those are the yearly challenges. What strategies you should implement in anticipation of future change will depend on the accuracy of the forecast and the support from various government and academic institutions. And this, to me, uh, when we talk about climate change and looking into the future, uh, we need to then build those infrastructure now. Now is the time to build the infrastructure because these things take a long time. Uh, to develop a variety uh, before it actually goes to the market takes five, 10, not five, cannot take up to 10, 12 years because it has to be virus tested, you have to make wine, and wine has to be drinkable, and then it has to be acceptable to the consumer. So these are some of the challenges I find. I think it's the long-term adaptation strategy that is more problematic because governments do not think in terms of long-term. Uh, they think in terms of short-term. Uh, so we need permanent institutional infrastructure that they in place regardless of who is in the government to carry on the research from one year to the next. Uh, so that the grape growers and the wine industry is a beneficial of long-term uh, research uh, that is done by organizations and various institutions. And that to me then is going to be the challenge, uh, is, to, is the future. Uh, how do we deal with and anticipate the future and make uh, those changes now to minimize the risk uh, that we're likely to face uh, with climate change because it may not get better. I hate to say this, and I'm talking like, it may not get better, it'll get worse. Throughout the world, uh, some of the instabilities that we're seeing is not just a result of politics, it's a result of very, very drastic environmental changes. We're seeing environmental refugees, we're not just seeing refugees as a result of wars and civil wars and so on and so forth. What we're seeing in environmental refugees, and that is a result of what's happening to the climate. We're seeing more catastrophic, more extreme events, and that is likely to be the, one of the worst case scenarios in the future. I hate to end on that note, but thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. With that, uh, open the floor for questions. If there's any questions out there, either uh, in the in the room here or online? Yeah, we had a question from someone named Bernie. He asked, can we expect warmer or cooler PDO and more blocking patterns, which can change the jet stream, causing Arctic temperatures? And is there a better predicting methods in the near future? Warmer E. PDO. PDO. Yes. Yes, what do you need <laughs> Well, one of the things about uh, the weather is not, we're not just only seeing a change uh, in climate that is uh, driven by um, greenhouse gases, but also there are the natural factors, like, such as El Nino and La Nina. Um, they, they can also uh, have a significant impact, as we've seen in the case of uh, um, El Nino uh, last year, very, very mild winter, uh, but also while it was beneficial for us here in, uh, in North America, caused major, major flooding in parts of uh, 
of Brazil and Peru and so on and so forth. And of course, droughts in Australia and droughts in India and severe droughts in Horn of Africa and so on and so forth. So those are changes that are not part of the climate, they're kind of embedded within the climate change scenario. But those are some of the factors also that is occurring. And, and we are also, uh, the, if you will, uh, impacted by the Nino and La Nino uh, in conjunction with the gradual change that are attributed to the buildup of greenhouse gases. Any other questions? Right. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Okay. Thank you. Here we have a we have a gift here for oh. for taking your time to all inclusive uh, to bar, to uh, Cuba. Exactly. <laughs> thank Try you. to take care of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, let's round of applause for Tony. Thank you very much. Yeah. So next uh, week the lecture uh, series continues, and uh, actually I'm speaking uh, next week, and I'm going to follow up on uh, some of the data that uh, that Tony's presented today, and talk about the uh, the impacts of how climate change and the potential impacts of climate change, and how it can uh, influence grapevine dormancy and, and cold hardiness. So we'll talk about some of the things we've been seeing with some of the volatility over the last uh, few years, and and talk about some of the long term issues. We also have a special lecture uh, taking place tomorrow at 11 a.m. So we're excited about, uh, about having this special lecture. Uh, and it's with Dr. Uh, Sudarsana uh, Pujari, who's a virologist from uh, Summerlin Research and Development Center in BC. So he's going to be giving a very uh, pertinent talk about uh, diagnostics used for virus detection in grapevine material, as well as the pros and cons of these various techniques uh, that are in current use. So please join us tomorrow for this special uh, lecture series. Again, it's 11 o'clock, 11.30 um, a.m. tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.